Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Investing Strategies. We're closing 2020 out with a bang. First up, we're taking a look at the top technology themes and companies to watch as we head into the new year. From Apple to Zillow and a lot in between, Gene Munster of Loop Ventures walks us through the trends that are set to take center stage in 2021. Plus, Michael Dunn of Zozo Go explains the heightened interest in Chinese electric vehicle stocks as of late and how these ambitious upstarts stack up to industry leader Tesla. And IBD's Justin Nielsen breaks down some strategies for holding top-notch growth stocks for longer time horizons to capture those benefits of compounding just like Warren Buffett. Investing Strategies starts right now. Well, with so many tech stocks to choose from, how should investors go about selecting the ones best positioned to see gains in the next year? Well, joining me now with insights about the technology themes set to take center stage in 2021 is Gene Munster, Managing Partner at Loop Ventures. Thanks for joining me today, Gene. Thank you. All right, so this year has brought with it a pretty notable acceleration in the adoption of certain technologies due to the shifting habits in response to the coronavirus pandemic. But what stands out in your mind as the technology themes and stocks that are, are, that are set to have the biggest impact in the coming year? So fast forward to 2021, it's still about this digital transformation, this impact. These tech companies have been important but there's some new entrants to uh, companies that will have a massive impact. Those new entrants, of course, are IPOs. There's two that we're gonna be keeping a close eye on in 2021. One is Affirm. This is a point of sale lending platform. Essentially, when you're going through e-commerce, you can buy things on a monthly payment basis. But what's more important is it really plays into this theme, whether it's millennials or the early front of Gen Z, buying things on subscription. This is the rent versus the buy opportunity and a firm is right there. About 30 plus percent of their business is with Peloton, gives you just an example of the types of things that people are buying with a firm, but this is one that really can disrupt the FinTech space. And second in uh, the IPO uh, segment is Roblox. Uh, this is something that I do not play, but they have a, just a, a, a very powerful, loyal base. And this is a game typically by teenagers, but this company is effectively the next social network. It's a 2D social network. When we think about the future of virtual worlds, we think about the impact of virtual reality. Uh, the first formation of that is gonna be through gaming platforms. And Roblox has a massive opportunity really to be this next social network platform, a different perspective than most people have. So those are a couple of the ones, the up and comers, and then a couple of companies to focus on that have been around for a little bit, Zillow, what they're doing in real estate. This is gonna be, 2021 is gonna be the slow shift away from top of the funnel, which they own today. 250 million plus people check Zillow on a daily basis. It's basically anyone who's got uh, income in the US. And uh, I think that they're gonna be more impactful on the buying part of trading homes, taking friction out of a market that has uh, longed to become impacted by tech. And then Apple, I think what they're doing around digital transformation is underappreciated. It's one that a lot of people talk about, but I think the significance specifically about how they can change more of their hardware into a subscription type businesses, this is gonna be good for the company's revenue and also Apple's multiple. Yeah, it sounds like the story is still in the early stages of playing out on that front for Apple. For sure. uh, and speaking of, uh, can you talk to us a little bit more about your thoughts for not just Apple in the coming year, but also Tesla, these two big tech titans, both of them announced a, it had stock splits this year. So a lot of excitement from that perspective as well. What do you think the future is for Apple? Uh, Apple and Tesla as you know, sort of those two big tech popular stocks in a, a lot of investors' minds. I think about the, if you're gonna to have to pick one in the near term over the next year, which one's gonna do better? I suspect that's gonna be Apple. In particular, just because of the big run that Tesla has had, I think mm -hmm. sometimes it's hard to kind of compound those kind of returns. But more importantly, when I think about those two, both these companies long-term are in a great position for very different reasons. In the case of Apple, it is the ability to empower this digital transformation that we talked about. It's not just working and living from home or learning from home. It is about 
the, the priority we're putting on these devices and services has been heightened and that will sustain beyond the pandemic. Apple is a wheelhouse play. If you just look at their Mac revenue growth in the last few quarters, it has skyrocketed. That's a great example of this digital transformation. Apple will benefit from that throughout 2021. And don't forget, we got a 5G iPhone cycle, which will benefit uh, their, their comps as well. And then second, in terms of Tesla, this one much more controversial. When you look at it relative to its market cap, the other major auto companies, it is much bigger. But I think ultimately the case that this is a tech company is a valid case. If you look at what they're doing with their software revenue that is going into deferred, that's high margin revenue. And more importantly, the product that they're building is ultimately continues to win users. They have 85% market share of EVs in the US. Next year is gonna be the year where they continue to grow. There's gonna be some teething around that growth where they need to build factories or potential acquire assets of other automakers to build, to build cars. That's gonna be the story next year with Tesla is their ability to keep up with this 40% plus growth in demand. It is quite remarkable, but I think that's gonna be the story. When you put it all together, and I'll, I'll leave the best for last here, Tesla longer term is not gonna be a car company. I do believe that it is gonna take their tech that they've evolved in, in uh, automaking and apply that to new markets, HVAC, insurance, autonomy, flying taxis, perhaps. All right. Well, Loop Ventures Loop Frontier Tech Index is all about uh, looking at cutting edge technology and innovations. And uh, that index tracks a select group of companies that are in companies that are influencing the future of technology and investors can get exposure here with the Loop Frontier ETF with the ticker LOUP. Now, Gene, the ETF has been on an incredible run as of late. So talk to us about the methodology for the selection of stocks in this index. I'm uh, also particularly interested to hear more about Pinterest be having the top weighting as of uh, now in this ETF. So at the core, our methodology is about growth and our belief in following tech for two plus decades is that if companies aren't growing, then they are not succeeding. Their technology simply doesn't have a place. And so that's the piece that we overweight in our index is companies and their future growth outlook. We also value being contrarian and thinking about companies in a different way. And that's how Pinterest fits its way into our index based on it being a play on augmented reality. Now, stick with me here as Pinterest is for most people just simply an image discovery platform. But we view images as the basis of augmented reality and training some of these neural networks. I think that this is an aspect of the Pinterest story that is largely underappreciated. And that's why it finds its way into our index. So, uh, you know, something like an Apple, which you're talking about the prospects for growth in the next year, uh, not showing up in this index right. and something like a General Motors showing up. It, talk to us about how that how that makes sense. It's about growth. That's the ultimate key. And I think uh, just specifically about there is market cap uh, limitations on this. We're looking for less well-known names. Uh, so there's a $250 billion market cap. So for example, we've had Tesla and Nvidia in the index, but we've had to sell that as mm. both of those have raced through that $250 billion uh, market cap. GM finds its way in there. Part of the reason is that if you think about broader auto, the only two existing auto companies that we think have a legitimate shot at having a business beyond uh, a long-term business is GM and Volkswagen. And so this is one that's, uh, again, a contrarian out of favor, but should see some positive growth trends around some of what they're doing with crews and autonomy that find its way into the index. Well, fantastic. And it looks like the future is as bright as ever for cutting edge technology, Gene. We're going to continue to track this ETF's performance and all of the companies that you mentioned throughout this segment. We really appreciate your perspective today. Thank you. All right, and coming up next, we're taking a closer look at the heightened interest in China EV stocks and how these ambitious upstarts stack up to Tesla. We'll be right back. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to IBD Live. Okay, here we go.
Chinese electric vehicle stocks NIO, Liado, BYD, and Xpeng are in focus as investors look to capture the next hot trend in the stock market. But which ones are just a flash in the pan and which companies could potentially give Tesla and other major automakers a run for their money? Here to weigh in is China EV expert Michael Dunn, CEO of ZozoGo. Thanks for joining me today, Michael. Thank you, Alyssa. Great to be here. All right, so a lot of these China EV stocks are finally coming back down to earth a little bit after some meteoric moves, but their valuations remain pretty sky high and they're getting quite a bit of attention right now. So what do you think is behind this heightened interest as of late? All right, let's step back for a moment and look at the big picture. We're in the midst of a once in a hundred years transformation of the auto industry. And what do I mean by that? For most of the last century, the heart of the car was the engine, pistons and drivetrains and fuel and spark plugs. But what we're moving toward and very quickly is that the new heart of the car will be a computer and the new gasoline of the car will be software. So what is that? why does that matter? Well, Tesla's pioneering this transformation and the car is changing before our eyes so that when investors look at new car companies, they start to ask themselves, are they the old type engine centered or are they the new type computer and software centered? And with these Chinese firms, Neo, Xpeng and Li Auto, we definitely see them in the Tesla camp. And that explains the great valuations and the huge enthusiasm for these stocks. Interesting. So would you say that those three stand out the most to you in terms of ones that are really going to start ramping up production and have, have that kind of edge in terms of technological innovation? Yes, no question about it. Xpeng, the auto. Um, there's a few others, WM Motors, as well as NEO. They really are the ones out front. I call them part of the fabulous five, the fab five. And Michigan basketball fans will remember these guys from years ago. Very talented, very young, and very fragile. Keep in mind that about a year ago, NEO needed a bailout from a provincial government in China because as an electric vehicle startup, things are touch and go. They're not making money yet. And yet suddenly when Tesla's stock started to soar earlier this year, investors said, oh, we're too late for the Tesla train. What other car can we jump on? And the names Neo, Xpeng, and the auto really stand out in that regard. But I want to emphasize the fact that we're still early days. These are companies that are less than five years old, and they will need to go through many more hurdles before they establish themselves on a par with Tesla. Interesting. Yeah, that was that was going to be my follow up question to you. Where does Tesla fit into all this? Because clearly they're that 800 pound gorilla when you're talking about the EV pure plays, they have big operations in China. So where does Tesla fit into this landscape? Do you think they're still the dominant player or should they be worried with all of these startups with China government backing it? It sounds like hot on their tail. Tesla's way out in front, make no mistake about it, at least five years ahead of everybody else in the industry, whether established automakers want to admit that publicly or not. In private, they acknowledge that Tesla's got it figured out, not just in the sense of knowing how to build great electric vehicles, but designing the car around the computer so that there's software updates that come over the air while you're sleeping at night. You have autonomous vehicle functions. You really have an advanced supercomputer on wheels and Tesla's in a class by itself. Also helping Tesla, they started a factory in Shanghai earlier this year. And this, uh, for the calendar year 2020, Tesla will sell more than 100,000 cars in China. This, that's a phenomenal start. No global automaker has had such a fast start. So Tesla's way out in front and there's no secret, Xpeng and Neo and others make no secret of their ambition to become the Teslas of China. They're giving chase, they're pursuing, they enjoy the backing of the government, but it won't be any easy trick to catch number one, Elon Musk and Tesla. Yeah. So where do you see the China EV market headed from here? Do you see any industry consolidation happening in the future? Or do you think we're set to see even more uh, EV names, you know, maybe lesser known ones that are behind the Fab Five that you mentioned cropping mm -hmm. up and, and really trying to gain momentum there? Well, there, as we know, there's hundreds, literally hundreds of EV makers. 95% of them you can set aside. They're not going to be relevant. They're going to go away. They're going to fail. They're going to go bankrupt. 
But um, so because you need deep, deep pockets. And this is what Neo has. They're backed by Tencent. Xpeng is backed by Alibaba. And Lee Auto's founder is a billionaire in his own right. So they need the big bucks. They need the backing and they need the government support. And when those are required, the, the field really narrows quickly. So five or six companies is all. Don't look for some other ones coming up quickly from behind. This is it. All right. And then talking about the backing of the likes of Tencent and Alibaba and uh, you, other U.S. automakers looking to maybe grab a piece of the pie. Do you see any sort of other partnerships or acquisitions on the horizon? You know, this is one thing that distinguishes the tech industry, tech driven, software driven, new generation of automakers from their, their cousins in the Chinese auto industry. So most traditional Chinese auto companies have partnered with global automakers and GM and BMW and Toyota, they all have joint ventures in China with partnerships. But what's different with these tech companies is they're saying, you know what, electric autonomous connected vehicle technologies are so new, we don't need to partner with global automakers. We're already there. In fact, we could go ahead of them. We could leapfrog them. And as a result, in as much as the global automakers would like to partner with these Chinese companies. I don't think that's going to happen. Look for the Chinese to go alone and say, we can do this with our own brains and our own money. Yeah, no, speaking of uh, maybe the little bit of the battle between the US and China, we have these fraud allegations against Candy Technologies, an EV player there, and talk of potential delistings of China stocks due to those regulatory compliance and auditing issues. Do you think US investors should be wary of the risks that this poses for some of these high flying names that we've seen? A absolutely, there are risks. Uh, number one risk is the heightened tensions between the United States and China. We haven't seen this level of acrimony in 40 or 50 years. Uh, it's really serious and it's not going to go away anytime soon. So political risk is there. In addition, Chinese companies, for reasons that we don't need to go into here and now, but are important, uh, they're able to list on U.S. exchanges without full transparency into their financials. I think that's well known on Wall Street now, but maybe not so well known among retail investors. So buyer beware, you may not be seeing the entire picture when you buy a Chinese company. All right, well, is there anything else that investors should know before looking uh, more into uh, Li Auto, Neo, or any of these other China stocks that are cropping up in the EV space? Yes, I think uh, Chairman Mao used to say, the future is bright. There will be some bumps along the way. Keep that in mind when you invest in these Chinese Fab Five. Um, five years from now, I expect them to be doing very well. But between now and then, some problems are bound to arise and there will be setbacks. So get ready for a rocky ride. But overall, it looks quite promising. All right, Michael. Well, thank you so much for your time and expertise today. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And next, we're sharing some lessons growth investors can take from Warren Buffett when selecting top stocks for the long term. That's after the break. I'm Arusha Pierce and welcome to Investing with IBD. Every week, we are going to give listeners insight on how the market is doing. We'll identify stocks or ETFs that are worth considering and adding to your watch list. Not only do we have investing experts, we like to bring on business leaders. The response from listeners has been amazing. It really feels like we're building this community. Join me every week as we take on the market. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Warren Buffett is considered one of the kings of value investing, but there are some lessons growth investors can learn from the Oracle of Omaha. And here to break down some strategies for holding top-notch growth stocks for longer time horizons is Justin Nielsen, IBD's Market Research Director. Thanks for your time today, Justin. Thanks for having me again, Allie. All right, so Warren Buffett is, of course, known for holding stocks for long periods of time, like McDonald's, Coca-Cola, and Apple, to name a few. He has said, though, that other investors shouldn't trade like him, that they should just stick their money in an index fund and forget about it. But for those growth investors out there who like picking individual stocks to achieve outperformance, they can hold them like Buffett, so to speak, by using just a few parameters. Isn't that right? 
Sure. But you know, one thing that you just have to keep in mind is uh, one thing that Warren Buffett really has going for him is time. And whenever you're doing compounding, time absolutely works in your favor. You know, just consider the example of $1,000 that you're growing at 10%. Sure, it's $100 that first year. But after the 10th year, the growth on that is now closer to like $260. So the, the compounding really works to your favor. And all of the graphs are just amazing when you look at what compounding can do. So what about in an individual stock? If you can get that compounding in an individual stock, there's some pretty amazing gains that are there to be won uh, on a lot of these stocks. And if you also combine some of those growth components that we look at, then you can really have the best of both worlds. Now let's dig a little deeper and Justin, walk us through how you even go about finding the stocks that are worthy of holding for these longer time periods because at IBD we often talk about position trading which is holding stocks for several weeks to several months but not these long time frames so where do you start well, well, sure. And this is what uh, we created a long-term leaders uh, list. We have both a portfolio and a watch list. And this is kind of handpicked by a number of uh, uh, markets team members. And what we look for in particular are those stocks that are showing both strong fundamental and technical action. You know, on the technical side, we want to see stocks that are able to outperform the S&P 500 over a long period of time. Because Again, while Warren Buffett suggests that most people are fine just buying an index fund, if you can buy stocks that are outperforming the indexes, and if you just get a little bit of extra performance each year, year after year, then you're going to be compounding those gains even more. So that's what we're really after on the technical side. You know, So there's a lot of these stocks that you look at, though, and the, the, the old guard that a lot of people mention, the things that, you know, the orphan and widow stocks that people talk about, the JP Morgans and such. But you look at those and over a long period of time, they're not, they're not outperforming the S&P 500. So why take on the individual stock risk instead of just buying the index? If you look at something like Microsoft. So this chart of Microsoft shows, here's a stock that over the last five years has been just growing phenomenally compared to the S&P 500. And so now you've got something on the technical side that is showing very strong action. And if you combine that with an earnings growth rate, that is great. And even more importantly, an earnings stability. So we look at the stability of that earnings. And if you can get those two factors in addition to the technicals, well, now you're dealing with something that you can potentially hold for a much longer period of time than those few month position size uh, trades that we're talking about. Okay, so now what do you do once you've found those cream of the crop stocks that have those proven characteristics that warrant holding for longer time periods? How do you know if you should continue holding when you're not seeing those high octane moves? You're just seeing maybe a uh, little gains here and there, maybe down a little bit or sideways periods. How do you know if you should continue holding or if it's time to get out? Well, going back to our example with Microsoft, I mean, you can see that this had a beautiful run in the 90s, but from 2000 to 2015, basically, it was doing nothing. You know, it was just sideways action. Um, let's go ahead and flip over to TDG. This is one that had uh, Transdime Group had this phenomenal run for a very long period of time. And when the coronavirus crash hit in 2020, well, this one was not doing so great. It's come back quite a bit, but this is not something that necessarily uh, you would have wanted to sit through. So there are conditions where we kind of say, look, you're not going to necessarily want to sit through something if the market is not favorable. And one of, there's three things that we'll look at for determining whether the market is not favorable for holding these long-term leaders. Uh, number one, if we get one of these, what we call a vertical violation, it's a very severe break of our moving average lines. It usually indicates that we're gonna need some extra time, a few months to recover from that kind of uh, violent shakeup in, in the market. Um, also, if we start seeing some of the psychological indicators get a little bit too euphoric, um, one thing that we look at is margin debt. The year-over-year -year margin debt, once that starts increasing a little bit too much, say 55% year-over-year, well, that's meaning that people are getting a little bit excessive in how much margin they're wanting to use versus the prior year. Or maybe it's the index itself. Once you see a triple in the indexes over a period of time of five years, like on the S&P 500, well, that's usually something that 
um, leads to a more serious correction. And there's no reason that we need to stick with these uh, during very serious corrections. It's much better if you can kind of sidestep that and then potentially get back into some of these names if they recover or maybe the new batch of winners. All right, so those are some really great signals to look at. And let's also talk about individual stocks and their charts and the long-term signals that you're looking at there as sort of your guideposts for helping you know whether to stay in or, as you said, help you determine if you need to move on to the next batch of winners. Well, uh, one of the big things is, is it still outperforming the S&P 500? And the best way for us to look at that is to look at the relative strength line. When you look at the relative strength line, that compares a stock versus the S&P 500. When that line is going up, it's outperforming the S&P 500. When that line is going down or flat, it means it's underperforming or just staying in line with it. And again, my feeling is, why would you want to hold on to a stock with all of that individual risk if you could just buy the S&P 500 and have the same type of return with a diversified risk. So let's take an example with Fiserv. Uh, the symbol on that is FISV. Now this is one that we did have on our long-term leaders list, but you can see that at a certain point, this relative strength line, and we're looking at a monthly chart here, this relative strength line did have a kind of break below its trend. You know, so if you just kind of draw a line here and you can see that it broke below that trend, and that kind of signals to us, hey, the outperformance might be under pressure at this point. Now, just one month isn't necessarily going to bother us. But if we do see two months where it is kind of lower on that relative strength line, especially below that trend, then that's going to potentially signal to us that it might be more serious and we might be taking an exit there. Okay, so now that we've talked about some of the sell signals, let's circle back and talk about some of the buy rules for these long-term leaders. We already talked about the characteristics that we wanna see, that strong track record of growth, but let's get a little bit more technical and talk about the chart action and what you wanna be seeing there. Because if you're seeing those gains little by little versus an explosive move over a short time period, it seems like you wanna be buying one of these stocks closer to their moving averages. Yeah, I mean, and this is where if this is truly going to be if you're truly identifying a long term leader, this is where pullbacks are absolutely appropriate, because, uh, again, if it's in an overall long term uptrend, those pullbacks can be a chance for you to be getting in on a stock, um, not while it's at its peak, but where it's kind of taking a regular break. And this is something that's very natural and normal for stocks to do. Um, and it also kind of prevents you from necessarily getting into a position where if you've bought a stock when it's at its highs and it's extended, uh, if it does go through one of those pullbacks, you might be in that difficult position of being down considerably on the stock and not knowing, okay, how much more room do I give it? So sometimes buying those on the pullbacks. And again, it's not that we're buying on weakness, we're buying on a temporary pullback and we usually wait for that strength to come back into the stock and that's what tells us hey we can we can go ahead and make a purchase here um, now sometimes you will see something where uh, like in the case of paypal here if you look at the weekly chart uh, we often are using the 10-week moving average line as our line in the sand for our position trades so once you cross below that 10-week moving average line that's often a place that we're going to exit but with PayPal, it had those qualities of a long-term leader. So on our leader, leaderboard product, what we decided to do was when it broke below that 10-week line, we were treating it like a long-term leader. And so we held on for a bit. And then when it had another break below the 10-week line, we just trimmed it. And the reason we trimmed it was because we wanted to give this more room, possibly down to the 40-week moving average line, which is what we do for a lot of these long-term leaders, building that cushion. Because again, we don't want to give up too much capital. You know, it's when you're giving up capital, that's when you can get in, in trouble. When you're playing with house money, it's a whole different situation on how you can handle your stocks. And another distinction between the strategy for long-term leaders and position trading in terms of buying, talk to us a little bit about the position that you're taking on this, whereas with position trading, you may be buying some and then adding to it. How do you want to be approaching these long-term leaders? Well, sure. I mean, you know, it depends on how concentrated you get in your portfolio. Bill O'Neill, the founder and chairman of Investors Business Daily, for a long time, he was getting into stocks and only having eight stocks at a time. So that meant he would have 12.5% to 20% positions. Um, and then if you consider the appreciation that happens in the stock 
over time, that could get into a very large position. And it's much more difficult to hold on to something. Let's say it takes a, a 10% or 20% hit, which would be normal. If you're going to hold on to something for 10 years, you better believe you're going to sit mm-hmm. through some 20% corrections in the stock. But if that starts to get to be a larger percentage of your portfolio, that's going to be very difficult to hold on to. So a lot of times with our long-term leaders, um, we're going to start them at 5% positions. And you know, rather than adding to, to them like we might uh, in, in a normal position portfolio where we're only going to be holding on to them for a few months, we're going to kind of take the run and then move on to the next thing. With a long-term leader, uh, you, you might not be adding to it as much because, again, you don't want to get too top-heavy in it. You don't want it to become too large of a position because then it's going to be harder to hold through those corrections if it's too big a weight in your in your portfolio. All right, Justin. Well, thank you so much for that very in-depth overview, breaking down all of these strategies and shedding light on these long-term leaders. Thanks so much. Happy to help. All right. And thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Investing Strategies. For Investors Business Daily, I'm Alyssa Corum. Hi there. Thanks so much for watching Investing Strategies on our YouTube channel. If you want more executive interviews and analysis of key trends to watch, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can stay up to date.